so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Let me see if we can get these slides shared and then we will be off to the races. Let's see here. How are we doing there? Perfect. Fantastic. Well, I have the good fortune to get to do every day something that I'm super passionate about and love, and that is to open up the doors to space to the rest of the world, to all of us. It, it's really interesting when you look at the history of space, how narrow that access has been and how wide it's becoming. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that story and a little bit about some of the things I think about day to day of a future of living and working in space. Now at Blue Origin, we are a commercial space flight company. And that's something that didn't even exist when I was in high school. Uh, I think it's really interesting to think about this emergence of a whole different way of accessing space. It's not just national space agencies, but also uh, entrepreneurial ventures and a really exciting dynamic world of, of commercial activity. When we are talking about space at Blue Origin, we're thinking about a future where there are millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. Now, that's easy to say and hard to do. And we have a really incredible team of, of engineers and lawyers and businessmen and women uh, and designers and so on that are all working to help us make this future possible. But when you think about the why, you know, we, we keep coming back to Earth. And it's kind of funny for a space company, but when we've looked around the solar system, you know, we've been to all the planets in the solar system now, at least robotically, and Earth is still by far the best planet. If we are choosing where to live, this is the place we want to be. But it's finite. We only have so much resources here on our planet, and we want to make sure that we take care of it and steward it for many, many generations to come. Space is really interesting for a lot of reasons, but one of those is that it has abundant resources. It has abundant you know, space, room, land. Uh, it has abundant energy. It has abundant mineral resources. It even has abundant water. And when we think about a future where we continue to grow and thrive here on Earth, space needs to become a part of that dialogue. Space is also incredibly uh, interesting as a place. And when I think about space, I have been dreaming since I was a young girl about a day when I can go and do this, just to look down at our incredible planet and, and see it in all of its glory. And, and I think it's really interesting to think about what it means when not just a few astronauts get to go, but all of us get to go to space. And I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how do we open those doors wider and wider? How do we democratize space for you and me? Now, some futures uh, look like this. This is a, a design from the 1970s of a giant round toroid, a, a giant donut in the sky uh, where we can actually create gravity and create communities. Uh, it's a far cry from what we saw in the Apollo days, but a really beautiful future thinking not just about the science and the engineering and the technology, but also about the humanity that comes as we move off planet in bigger and bigger numbers. How do we make sure that this is a good community? How do we make sure it has all the things that, that we need to not just survive as humans, but to thrive? Other more recent futures take a, a little bit uh, different view of what that could look like and, and imagine cities, skyscrapers, uh, vertical farming, and all sorts of other industrial technologies that would come into play. Or maybe our future in space is a much more expansive natural one. How do we think about bringing the best things of Earth with us into space, uh, you know, both in terms of, of ecosystems uh, and in terms of our interactions with them. So when I think about where that leads us, I start by thinking backwards just a little bit. And the history of space travel has been a fairly modest one, an exciting one, but a modest one so far. The first human to ever travel uh, in, into space, Yuri Gagarin did so in 1961. And we raced into a Cold War uh, competition between the Soviet Union and the United States that drove the first couple of decades of, of space exploration. And then we started to move into an era where space became driven more by science and by discovery and by 
uh, the opportunities to, to really do some incredible research. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But where we're moving now is to an era where we say, well, it took us about 50 years to get to the first 500 astronauts and cosmonauts and taikonauts that had ever flown to space. But how do we get to 5,000 people? How do we get to millions? And I think that we're just at the cusp of that turn uh, as we start to talk about commercial space exploration and living and working in space. Now, as I said, uh, I have a, a dream of going to space myself someday. I haven't gotten to go yet. Uh, but I have gotten to do some really exciting stuff. And one of those was a trip uh, on what they call the Vomit Comet. Uh, this is an airplane that flies like a giant roller coaster in the sky. Uh, big waves about 10,000 to 15,000 feet tall. And then really fun thing about these airplanes, these parabolic flights, is that at the top of those hills, just like at the top of a roller coaster, you start to fall at the same rate as the aircraft. And that's kind of a funny concept. But when we, when we talk about being in space and microgravity or zero G, you know, some people think you actually get rid of gravity in space. And that's not true. You just fall at the same rate as your vehicle. And that's true in orbit and it's true in these airplanes. And on the aircraft, you get about 10 or 15 seconds of pure weightlessness. And it's a really incredible thing to be able to dance on a ceiling uh, or to be able to float in midair. But it's also really interesting from a science perspective. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that brings us. So first I want a, a thought exercise. And this is for you to sort of get in your head. Think about your future community that's living and working in space. Maybe it's like one of those space settlements we looked at earlier. Maybe it's something totally different. But you come home from working uh, during the day or you're home for dinner. What does dinner look like? Where do you sit? Do you sit down at all? What does your meal look like? What does your beverage look like? I wanna talk about a few of the things that we know about microgravity science that might drive how you conceptualize that future. Let's start with fire, because fire is always a fun place to start and, and rocket people love fire. If you look at the flame on the left, this is the classic flame that we've all grown up knowing here on earth. And a candle, has this sort of tapered uh, almond shaped flame. And that's driven by combustion. When combustion happens, it makes hot gases and those hot gases are less dense than the air around them. And so on earth, they rise and it pulls that flame up into its classic shape. Now in space, when you're in free fall or microgravity, you don't get that differentiation. Lighter things aren't lighter in space heavier things don't sink. So instead of lighter gases pulling up the candle into a peak, flames stay small and spherical. And that's really interesting, both because they burn cooler, you have a cooler flame and that's an interesting process, but also because they teach us a lot about the process of combustion. And we've been able to use insights gleaned on the International Space Station and other platforms to help us design more efficient engines better understanding, better models of how that moment of ignition happens, because that is exactly the same process that's happening in every engine on the ground. It just usually happens very fast and then gets pulled away by all those hot combustion products. So what do your candles look like on your table, if you had candles? Fluids are really, really fun in microgravity. Uh, I'm not sure how well the video will come through, but the image on the left is an Alka-Seltzer tablet, an, an antacid tablet being dropped into a bubble of water. And if you've never checked out the Saturday morning science videos on YouTube, uh, mostly by Don Pettit, they're fantastic. So here Don was playing with what happens as you start to create that effervescence, that fizz. And you see that bubbles don't do the same thing that we expect on earth. They don't rise to the top, they don't layer. They just start to create this incredible surface tension. And you see that the, the, those layers are sort of all mixed up together. Interesting challenges if you're uh, trying to do research with fish in space, which has been done by a number of space agencies. How do you keep the air out of the water, out of the water tank for your fish? How do you think about what that might look like uh, for your dinner in space? On the right here, we see another video uh, by Don squeezing out of a, a drink bag, some drink into 
this really funny cup that he created. Now, this is actually the cover off of one of his protocol books. Uh, he's taken it and taped it into a teardrop shape. And at that bottom corner, you get an incredible amount of really cool effects from surface tension. They call this a critical wetting angle. And it means that fluids want to gather in that corner. Now, on the video on the left, we show that you can't make air and fluid go where you want to go. And yet on the right, Don has used physics to make that work. And it's really interesting to think about why you might care about this. So it's really good if you're trying to drive propellants to a specific place in a tank, or if you want to move liquids around for your life support system without having to have pumps. Now, Don's drinking there out of a cup. That's a really funny thing. We usually think about drinking out of straws in space, but here's a cup that was designed based on the experiments that, that Dr. Pettit did. And here we see Samantha Cristoforetti from the Italian Space Agency enjoying the first espresso in the space station out of one of these cups. It's a very different experience when you get to smell what you're drinking, whether that's tea or coffee or anything else. So what does your drink look like in space? The last of the phenomenon I wanted to talk about is another talk about separation of density and buoyancy. Normally, if we take a material that is made of uh, immiscible fluids, fluids that don't mix, and we shake it up, we tend to see that they will separate back out into layers. In space, that doesn't happen. So whether you're making a salad dressing or you're, you're leaving your last seeds sitting for a long time in the fridge, uh, you're not gonna see that separation. There's nothing that's pulling them apart. Density doesn't have the same effect. And that's really fun for, for thinking about uh, fluids and, and food, but it's also really powerful when you think about manufacturing. So here you see a really interesting detail that was from a study that NASA did back in the early 80s, where they took a piece of glass and they pulled the first fiber optic cable in microgravity. They actually did that on one of those uh, parabolic airplanes we were talking about earlier. And it turns out that when you pull glass into fiber optics on the ground, that you tend to get little inclusions, little precipitates, the denser parts of that molten glass make crystals. When you do the same thing in microgravity, you don't get crystals. You get this really clean glass fiber. And it's from the same phenomenon that we're seeing on the left. You don't get density driving the phenomenon of your manufacturing. So suddenly you can make the best fiber optic cable, I'd say in the world, but off this world by doing it in space. So lots of really interesting things that drive us to think about science and our, our just sort of intuition of materials a little differently. Now food itself, the early days of the space program, you may be familiar with these tubes. Uh, the, the early Soviet astronauts and American astronauts all ate food out of squishy toothpaste-like tubes. Maybe not the most fine dining experience. But as we've moved through and matured how we send things to space and how we live and work in space, we've gotten to get a lot more creative. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, Paolo Nespoli uh, in the center there in, in the blue t-shirt uh, is another Italian astronaut. I think there's something about the Italians liking to have great food uh, and, and the espresso you saw earlier with, with uh, Samantha Cristoforetti. So when Paolo came up to the space station, they sent him the materials for making pizzas. These were essentially flatbreads uh, with tomato sauce and some simple ingredients, but it's a long, long cry from food in a tube. Uh, when Sunny Williams went up as a NASA astronaut, her family sent her samosas to enjoy uh, while she was there. So we get to think much more expansively about a future of dining in space. And then I like to just think about the mechanics. Here's a picture of, of a dinner at the International Space Station. It's very crowded, uh, first of all. I, I love the speed limit signs posted on the wall, 17,500 miles an hour, 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's how fast the space station is traveling around the Earth. But you see that the astronauts have all gathered around the table, no chairs. They don't need chairs to sit, they're just floating. Uh, there's some straps on the table that are holding down some of their ingredients so they don't float away. You'll, you'll talk you'll hear astronauts talk about uh, being very careful about where they place their fork. 
but you'll also hear them talk about coming back to earth afterwards and dropping their fork in midair and realizing it will fall back to the ground now that they're back in normal earth gravity. So it's really fun to think about the, the things that we get used to as being normal. I like to think about a future where we can take those microgravity phenomena and make something really fantastic. Maybe it's a floating globule of drink. Maybe it's a decoration that you can only have in microgravity. Uh, the, the possibilities here are really endless and food is one of those things that brings cultures together, whether you are on earth or in space. So how are we getting there? We're not gonna make it all the way to the space station, but we are going to start to democratize the space uh, environment with vehicles like New Shepard. This is a, a rocket that I've been working uh, with for a number of years here at Blue Origin. It is really incredible. Uh, to not take your rocket and throw it away after a flight, but to now have reusable rocketry. Uh, that's both better for the environment, we're not throwing things away, it's a lot better for economics. If you imagine taking a flight uh, to maybe go see family in the times uh, after COVID, and then throwing away the airplane, air travel would be prohibitively expensive. Even if we drove to the city and threw away our car, you can't imagine what that, how much that would change our lives. So finally moving to an era where we can reuse these spacecraft is really changing the economics of space travel. And when I think about New Shepard, it's a suborbital vehicle. So it's basically doing one giant parabola, a lot like that airplane that we were talking about earlier. And that gives us up to the very edge of space and back. The Kármán line is at 100 kilometers. It's the internationally recognized boundary between Earth and space. Now, so far, less than 600 people have crossed that line and been to space. <clears throat> but if we think about the future, this is a vehicle that we would love to be flying every week. We would love to be opening up space travel, not just to national space agencies, but to communities and families and, and entrepreneurs and artists. When we're flying on New Shepard, we've had an opportunity to, to fly a lot of payloads a lot of experiments to take advantage of that microgravity environment we were talking about earlier. Now, I'm not sure how well this video will come through, but this is a project from the Southwest Research Institute uh, down in, in Texas here in the US. And SWERI, uh, as they're known, is really interested in the planetary science domain. How do we think about going to other planets, uh, maybe asteroids? What do we do when we get there? How do we take advantage of those abundant resources in our solar system? So this device was actually designed to do uh, regolith dirt collection uh, at the surface of an asteroid. And it has small magnets inside. So it, it opens up, it lands on the surface of the asteroid. And asteroids have very, very low gravity. So we, they're more a loose, many of them are more a loose collection of rocks and dirt than a solid mass of metal. So if you were going to land on one of those rocky asteroids, how would you collect the material? And how would you bring it home? The researchers used a flight on New Shepard to start to simulate that and to test out this really ingenious mechanism they had created. I love one of the stories behind this too, because what they did in envisioning this was to look to nature. They thought about how a starfish feeds, and they actually call this the clockwork starfish because a starfish feeds by taking its digestive system and pushing it outside of its uh, body and then pulling it back in. And here you see uh, a robotic starfish, a clockwork starfish, ingesting the regolith uh, around it. So that's our future that we're envisioning. It's the present that we are living in. We are opening those doors, not just for professionals, but also for students. We've had so many student experiments from all over the world. Now your science fair is not just something that you do in your kitchen, but it's something you can do in space. We are really excited to have in our journey, whether it is uh, with New Shepard or our future uh, efforts going to the, the lunar surface, to be bringing the youth of the world along with us. And I hope some of you got a chance to see my colleague, Joseph Ranke, talk about the club for the future. And this is an initiative that we have to help inspire the future leaders in uh, science and technology and space. We have a great program that you can check out online on our website, clubforfuture.org. 
And, and one of the first things that we are doing is offering students all over the world a chance to send something to space with us. Uh, these are postcards that we have received from uh, literally all over the planet. We had tens of thousands of these on our last New Shepard launch. Uh, so I, I welcome you to think about this future that we talked about today, to draw it on a postcard and to send it to us at, at Blue Origin. Club for the Future will put those onto the New Shepard rocket. We will fly them to space, bring them back and mail them back to you all for the cost of postage. And I think it's really fun to think about an era where you know, when I was a kid, you didn't get to touch something that went to space. And now as y'all are growing up, you can think about a present where you have on your, on your wall, something that you created that went to space and came back. So I'll, I'll just close with a, a quick short story. These are my two kids when they were much younger than they are now, but they grew up thinking about space as a place where they belonged. Uh, and one of my favorite stories is, is, is they're you know, sort of thinking about what their future looks like. Uh, my little guy uh, up in the corner here came home from preschool one day and he was talking to my husband who works, uh, works on building airplanes. And he said, daddy, when I grow up, I'm going to make airplanes, but Sally, she's going to make rockets because boys make airplanes and girls make rockets. And I think it's important because that's what they saw in their world. You know, that's what they saw as the possible for their future. And I can only imagine what happens as we raise a next generation that sees all sorts of possibilities and comes and joins us with a future of millions of people living and working in space. With that, I will stop the presentation uh, and turn to conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. That was very, very interesting. And thank you for including so many visuals. I think um, it made the talk even more interesting because we were able to see what you were talking about. And, uh, you know, I don't know about the rest of our attendees, but I certainly was very fascinated. So um, we have received a lot of questions for you. So uh, let's start right away. Um, the first question that we have here is, what is your opinion on uh, sustainable space exploration and green technology? So how do you think we're progressing around those lines? Yeah, it's a really important question, right? Especially if we're thinking about a future where the earth remains our primary home. And that, real, that really is what we are thinking about. There is no plan B for planet earth. We have to keep this planet uh, pristine. So we think about that a lot in, at Blue Origin. In, in fact, our company is named Blue Origin after our planet. This, you know, hundreds of years from now, when we are many places in the solar system, we will still look back at that, this blue planet and say, that is our origin. And so there are a variety of ways that you think about sustainability. Reusable rocketry is, is definitely an important one. Let's not throw away this, this uh, technology every time we fly. The New Shepard rocket is powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. When they come together, they just make water vapor. So that's actually not smoke coming out the back end of the rocket, it's steam. And that really is a much uh, more environmentally friendly approach. And we think about it in how we build our facilities, how we clean our parts, how we uh, you know, treat our, our planet day to day. But I think we also, it, it's good to, to keep in mind that rockets, are a very small part of, of pollution on this planet. Uh, and, and things like manufacturing and agriculture and, and uh, you know, many heavy industry and transportation uh, on the planet are, are a big part of the, the challenge that we're trying to solve. So if you look at the, the pollution created by airplanes, we would have to be flying rockets 40,000 times more than we are today to even equal the aviation industry. We're, we're a long way from being there. Very well put, though. I mean, I think, um, like you rightly said, it's such an important thing to talk about. And as we progress ahead, uh, if you're actually talking about thinking of going to other planets, it only makes sense that we uh, take serious efforts to look into sustainability and uh, you know so on. So the next question that we have here for you is, what is your opinion on privatization of space? And are we actually looking at everybody going to space if things keep progressing the way they are? Yeah, so I hope everybody gets a chance to go to space. Uh, as I said, I don't think we should all be moving off the planet. I don't think that that makes sense. 
Um, but I think that everyone should have an opportunity there. Uh, so that commercialization uh, is a big piece of that story. I don't think we're all going to go on behalf of our nations. I think we're gonna go uh, on behalf of ourselves and of, of our communities and of humanity. So as we open those doors, it, it's a really interesting question of how do we bring down the cost of access yeah. so that more people can participate. Uh, and I think that that, that that comes again, we talked about reusability, meaning that you don't throw away the system, means you don't pay for a new system every time. That helps. As we start to fly more often, we get better at those operations. That brings down the costs and that helps. And then we have to be really intentional about thinking about how we expand access. And things like Club for the Future are really designed to ensure that uh, space is a, a, a place for everybody uh, and that we, we, we really think about how do we uh, include the, the entire world in what we're doing. Very well said. Uh, Dr. Wagner, the next question that we have here is, what do you think about e-waste management in space? Because it seems to be on the rise. So how, how do we tackle the, uh, this problem? Was that waste management? Yeah, waste management. Yeah. So, so when, because space launch is still incredibly expensive, yeah. uh, it means that every pound we launch has a cost. And the, depending on the, the ways that you launch, it's as much as $10,000 a pound to space. So that actually drives a really important discussion about reuse and recycling. Uh, some great work going on uh, on the International Space Station right now uh, to close those systems and make things more reusable. And you think about that in a number of ways. One is reclaiming water. And so the International Space Station has the most modern toilet in the world. Uh, it can recover, I think it's almost 90% of the water uh, back for the space environment. Uh, so as, as the astronauts like to joke, uh, you know, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. Um, but that, so that's, that's an important technology when uh, launching a new pound of water is expensive, but it's also something that can inform how we live and work on Earth. And so I'd love to see this, this uh, interchange between the technology of space and the technology of our, our own lives. There's also some really cool work going on. Uh, there's a company I'd encourage you to check out called Made in Space. It's okay. doing the first 3D printing on the space station. And, and another company called Tethers Unlimited that has created a plastic recycler. So all the bags that things go up to the space station in can now be recycled into filament for 3D printers. So we start to see this nice closing of the ecosystem. Well, that's that those are some very beautiful examples that you put in there i would definitely encourage all our attendees to go check out the companies that dr wagner just mentioned they are in your chat box just make sure that you go and have a look uh, at what these companies are doing because uh, clearly they seem to be doing something right so okay so the next question that we have here is um, i think something that you will relate with very closely how do we make companies realize the importance of discussing space science in public discourses because obviously we don't hear as much as we should about space exploration because they are bound by so many policies in place and there's so much of um, privacy that comes into being so uh, what is your personal take on that i think there's a lot of great outreach going on and i i love that that the the festival reached out to to us at blue origin and invited us to join this conversation uh, we have employees that are out talking to all sorts of, of groups and classrooms uh, and it happens from companies and it happens from individuals and i would encourage uh, all my colleagues that are out there that, that may be into their careers already to think about how do we pay it forward Right, that, that we got here because people shared their, their visions and their experiences with us. So I take it as a personal responsibility and, and an exciting opportunity to share that with others. And I hope that others will too. I think uh, my key takeaway from your answer is uh, we got here because somebody else shared their insight, their knowledge with us. And it's only right that we continue to do so. So that was very well put. Absolutely. And I think it's really fun that we have with space in particular, there's also the opportunity just to, to dream about it, right? Yeah. And whether, whether it's Hollywood or Bollywood, people have been dreaming about space and sharing those visions for, for decades. Uh, I, I think that it's really exciting that, you know, I saw movies about space that really inspired me when I was younger. Uh, Apollo 13 was really formative for me in wanting to become an engineer. Uh, and, and to really see that possibility of problem solving, uh, not just being about the rocket, but being about the people inside. 
uh, well, Dr. Wagner, the next question that we have here is, what do you think are the top three challenges that we need to overcome for the huge uh, supply uh, or chain demand of supporting civilization outside of work, uh, outside of Earth? So what do you think are the three key obstacles in our way? Yeah, that's a fun question. There are so many obstacles. Space is hard. Um, I, the first one I'm going to keep coming back to is cost. As long as space is really expensive, we won't go very often. And those who get to go will be a very narrow slice uh, of our planet. Um, but that one's, that one's we're, we're working on that. Um, I think politics is another, another interesting one. The, the early space races were driven by conflict between governments. I would love to see things like the International Space Station where the next generation was driven by collaboration between governments. And that we think about ways of, of facilitating this and, and making it part of our, uh, our global discourse. Oh, wonderful. For number three, you know, there's so many good technical challenges to solve. There's so many good technical challenges to solve. Uh, my background is actually in biomedical engineering as well as aerospace. Uh, and when we think about a future of living and working in space, radiation is a big challenge. How do we, how do we keep our astronauts healthy uh, as we're living in an environment that's completely different than the one that we have evolved to, to be so well suited to here on Earth? So radiation, bone loss, muscle loss are things that, that uh, physicians and physician researchers are really keen on, on working on right now. Uh, well, Dr. Wagner, the third obstacle that you mentioned, uh, you made it very easy for me to link into the next question that we have, because it's on the lines of astronauts. So we do know that uh, Blue Origin is uh, working on sending astronauts to space. So how has your personal interaction been working with astronauts? And could you tell what, tell us a little, give us a little sneak peek into the training that goes behind uh, uh, training astronauts in Blue Origin? Yeah, absolutely. So we have not gotten to our first human space flight yet. We are getting really close. Uh, the vehicle that will take our first astronauts to space just flew for the first time this month. Uh, I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel and, and watch that flight if you're excited about these things. And But we're thinking a lot about how do we change from astronauts that have trained for their careers to go to space to you and I coming down and training for a day or two to go to space. Now, these missions are much shorter. You're not responsible for flying our rocket. Uh, the, the training is, is a lot easier. We want to make sure that you're going to be safe and that you're having fun. Uh, and so some of that is going to revolve around, uh, we call it microgravity etiquette. How do you avoid kicking your neighbor in the face when you're floating upside down? Some of it's going to be about just the safety systems in the vehicle. Very similar to when you get on an airplane and they talk to you about the, the safety systems. Oh. You can imagine you need to know the same things when you're traveling on a rocket. And so we're going to prepare you to be, uh, be safe and have a whole lot of fun on these trips. Well, uh, Dr. Wagner, uh, I, can, I can say on behalf of many, many uh, students out there, like you rightly mentioned, at least at some point of time in everybody's life, we've thought of becoming astronauts. So uh, thank you for giving us uh, that uh, little sneak peek into um, Blue Origins training. So um, what do you think um, is the role of collaborations in space exploration? So we do know about various uh, space uh, agencies coming together and working together. So what is your take on that? Yeah, as I was saying before, I think as space becomes less parochial and more global, that that collaboration really is at the core of it. Uh, one of the things that I've loved about space, even from its earliest days, even when nations were fighting, scientists were collaborating. And I, I think that you know, science is one of those things that can transcend uh, you know, specific interests. And we can really come to say, what is this fascinating thing that we're studying? How do we do that together? Uh, and the International Space Station certainly is, is you know, premier in, in thinking about those kinds of international collaborations. Um, when we look at the corporate level, uh, there's, we can't do what we do without you know, our suppliers and our partners. This is something that, that does take a village, as they say, to, to make it successful. And so those, those uh, how do you build an ecosystem that works together well, uh, I think is really one of the things that is I, I hope every student will come out of school having done team projects. 
uh, having had opportunities for collaboration, having gotten to build something with a group. Uh, the, those hands-on building experiences with a team are exactly the kinds of things we look for when we're hiring at Blue Origin, because that is the reality we live every day. So to all our attendees, make sure you do attend uh, your uh, team uh, projects and make sure you make the best of them because they are going to be handy uh, as you progress ahead. So um, the next question is again, very interesting. What do you personally uh, think of space movies such as Interstellar? Uh, how close are they to reality and how important do you think they are in shaping our uh, imagination? I love space movies. I have loved space since I was a little girl and the movies and books have been a big piece of sparking my imagination uh, and, and thinking about what's possible through somebody else's eyes. Now, the physics in space movies, it depends. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really horrendous. Um, you know, Gravity is one of my favorite space movies for just being visually beautiful. Uh, but the orbital mechanics are lousy. Uh, so I, I think one of the, my favorites, uh, I'll go back to Apollo 13, uh, Tom Hanks and, and his crew, you know, reenacting the real life flight of Apollo 13, which had so many problems in flight. Uh, but one of the, the fun tidbits about that, that movie is it was one of the first to actually film some of its scenes in microgravity. They actually filmed some of the scenes uh, on that parabolic aircraft that we were talking about. And so they got to experience weightlessness and, and it's not just special effects, but they're, they're, they're actually in free fall and, and dealing with those dynamics, which I think is really cool. Well, um, that was really insightful. Uh, Dr. Wagner, could you tell us a little about uh, the rocket uh, New Shepard that uh, Blue Origin has? I mean, a lot of our uh, attendees here know about the postcard program and we have told them about uh, the uh, functioning of the rocket but it would be really great if you could tell us a little more about the actually engineering that goes behind into make into the making of the rocket and how it works hmm, cool question so new shepherd is a suborbital rocket right it is uh, going up and coming back down uh, up to that carmen line at 100 kilometers um it is powered by a single engine, a BE-3 engine, and that's 110,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, again, we talked about it, it being powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, cryogenic temperatures in that fuel tank, in that propellant tank, uh, as they come together, getting really, really hot going out the, the rocket nozzle. So we have some really interesting challenges in material science for how you deal with extreme temperatures. Uh, we have some really exciting challenges in guidance, navigation, and control. So if you are a programmer out there, how do we take the data that we're giving? We're trying to balance, you know, we, we have our, our rocket, we're trying to balance it on, on its rocket nozzle. If you've ever tried to balance a spoon, that's really hard to do. A broomstick is much easier. This isn't a huge rocket. It stands about mm, 20, 25 meters tall, about, about 70 feet, uh, and it is, always having to take that engine and move that engine around to keep itself balanced, particularly as it comes back down for landing. So the modern modern processor speeds, doing the math to, to do that balancing act, really exciting challenges uh, and, and interesting technical opportunities. And then the vehicle itself has really two main parts. We have the, the booster, the rocket itself, uh, and then we have the capsule that sits on top. As they go up, they have about two and a half minutes straight up into that Texas sky. Uh, with 100,000 pounds of, of force pushing them up. And then the main engine cuts off. And the crew capsule separates pretty gently with some springs. And then they're coasting. Right? And then you're unbuckling your seatbelt and floating. And you're doing your, your microgravity science. But that the systems continue to go up, right? They still have momentum. They're still traveling up and then coming down uh, from the Kármán line. And now we have to think about the descent stage. So we have the crew capsule, three parachutes. Uh, they each have what's called a drogue chute. So a little tiny parachute that comes out first, stabilizes the vehicle, pulls out the main chute, and then those main chutes bloom like giant flowers in the, in the sky. Uh, as it comes down for a touchdown in the desert, uh, we have thrusters that, that kick up a lot of dust in the desert floor uh, as it makes a soft landing. So very much like a, an air pillow as it lands. The booster is going to come back down yeah. and it's been traveling uh, with its engine turned off. So now as it comes down from about Mach 
eight, uh, you know, three, more than three times the speed of sound, it's going to come out. It has drag brakes that flare out. Now that makes the cross-sectional area of the rocket quite a bit bigger, slows it down. If you st ever stuck your hand out the window of a car, you felt that drag, right? So we're creating drag. So now we're going subsonic speeds below the speed of sound. Uh, we have some uh, fins that allow us to control the roll and, and, and yaw of the rocket. And then we'll relight that engine. Uh, and that's a really exciting maneuver to watch. If you see the videos, the rocket's really, you know, below 10,000 feet when, the, when that engine relights. It's a spectacular thing to watch it come out of the sky from space. And then suddenly you hear the sonic booms and you see the engine relight and it slows to a stop just before the pad. Uh, Dr. Wagner, that sounded like a story. You you narrated the entire thing uh, as if it were a story. That was so beautiful to just hear. I mean, I, it honestly didn't feel like a very uh, technical talk to me. That sounded really great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, so the next question that we have here is, I mean, we have received so many questions and we're falling short of time. So we're just going to take two questions now. And that would be um, about it. So uh, the next question that we have here is, how successful have we been in simulating microgravity on Earth? Ah, this is a great question because there are ways to experience microgravity on Earth for very short durations. So if you go to your, your, uh, your nearest chair and you stand on top of the chair and you jump, you are weightless for a very, very short period of time. Uh, and there are, are places in the world where they have built very tall towers uh, so that they can drop things down the tower and get mm, five to 10 seconds of microgravity in the biggest ones. And so that gives you a, a very short exposure. Uh, if you want to simulate microgravity in some ways, you can also think about keeping things continuously in motion. And so biologists in particular love to do this. They have things called clinostats or random positioning machines where they're sort of taking the cell cultures and turning them so that the cells are always falling in the liquid that they're growing in. And that allows you to look at, at some pieces of, of how gravity works. If we're studying it in humans, uh, bed rest studies are actually very common. If you've ever had a, your, your arm or your leg in a cast, you know how much muscle you lose. Very similar, in fact, to, to being in space and not having to hold your body up. So these bed rest studies are a way that we mimic uh, the, the things like bone and muscle loss here on the ground. So lots of different ways of doing different pieces of it, but there is no room that you can go into and flip the switch and turn off gravity and float. I wish that there was, but you're gonna have to hop on an airplane or a rocket to do that. Um, Dr. Wagner, just give me one second because my uh, internet is just lagging for just a second. No worries. Just one second. And all right, uh, that, that looks slightly better now. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next question that we have for you here is uh, how, how far do you think we are from actually going and uh, staying and living in other planets? Or would you, would you be able to give us a rough estimate on the time uh, that we can look at? Yeah, so I think we will see commercial space travel is starting to happen now. So things like New Shepard are, are gearing up for first human flights and first commercial flights. And that, that is, to, you know, that's happening today. Uh, we see a lot of space agencies of the world gearing up to go to the moon. And I think the moon is just a few years away. Uh, and hopefully we're going in ways that are not just flags and footprints, but are sustainable communities. Uh, maybe looking a lot like a, a research base in Antarctica so that we start to see that kind of, uh, of community growing. Now, Mars is a lot harder to get to and a lot more expensive. I, I think it will probably be a while before we have a community living on Mars uh, and, and the other planets are even farther out and more expensive. So for me, I look a lot at what's happening uh, suborbitally in low Earth orbit and the moon is our, our real near-term opportunities and absolutely in my lifetime. And I, I really hope that you guys get a chance to go in yours. Thank you so much. That was definitely a, a very motivational uh, bit to end on. Um, now, before uh, we end the session, I'd just like to take your final thoughts and uh, 
like to ask you something that we ask all our uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Wagner, what role do you think public engagement platforms like India Science Festival play in order to bring science closer to society? How important do you think uh, platforms like these are? Oh, so critical, right? I, I think, oh, I'm hoping that my internet is coming through. Um, the engagement between scientists and engineers and the rest of the public is what gives us the power to dream. It's what gives us permission to, to think about a future that we take part in. Uh, and not just something that happens in, in some laboratory somewhere, but something that happens is, as part of, of our vision of our future. And I think that that's, that's absolutely critical to, to building up uh, the momentum, the passion and the capabilities of the next generation. So thank you so much to everyone who, who joined us today for this conversation. Uh, do keep thinking about your own dinner in space and the ways in which you want to make this happen. And, and know that it's not only careers in science and technology, but business and law and uh, arts and everything else that has to come together for these futures to become real.